Lord, we just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name this morning, Lord. That God, as we look at your word, as we examine your word today, that you would just have your way in our lives and through our lives. God, I just, I, I, we want you to be glorified and magnified in everything that we say or do. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and lives right now. And that, Father, that we would put our faith, our hope, and our trust in you in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about something that, uh, that's really something that we're all going to experience in life. And I want to talk to you about something that, that the Lord has been speaking to me about uh, where we're... we're People in general are concerned, not something that specifically uh, agape or even uh, any specific person in the church, but it's something that we're all going to deal with. And I'm talking to you this morning about overcoming disappointment. We've all been disappointed in life, haven't we? I mean, if you haven't been disappointed, let me see your hand because I'm going to need to pray for you and, and, and ask the Lord to, to give me some of what you got this morning because we all get disappointed in life, don't we? You know, whatever, it could be with family, it could be with friends, it could be with church or job or whatever it is. Every single area of our lives can experience disappointment. And if we experience enough disappointment in our lives, we eventually get to the point where we can become cynical or depressed or a whole bunch of different things we can feel and experience in life because we've experienced disappointment. But here's the thing is that when we read the Bible, when we read the Word of God, we see people constantly meeting disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, but we always see God there working in the midst of whatever that disappointment is. We always see God there pulling people through and, and, and just doing awesome and amazing things in their lives. And so you may be here this morning and be disappointed about something in your life. Maybe it's your health, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your kids or your job or whatever it is, but I'm here to tell you that even though you may be disappointed this morning, it doesn't have to stay that way. I want you to turn in your Bible, if you have it with you this morning, to the book of Ezra chapter 3. That's where we're going to spend our day today, Ezra chapter 3. And this is a, a, an interesting book, and it's found in the Old Testament, if you don't know where it is. And it's Ezra, in the book of Ezra, and where we're specifically going to be looking at, the year is somewhere about 500 B.C. I think it's about 537 B.C. And the place that we're going to find ourselves in is the city of Jerusalem. And what's happened here is basically the Jews have just returned to Israel after being in captivity in Babylon for a while. So they basically uh, were besieged and, and taken into captivity, taken into slavery basically, and they went to Babylon for a period of time. And so the Israelites have basically been living uh, in Babylon, some of them for, for a period of about 50 years at minimum. And so some of these people have been gone from their home for most of their life. They've not been back in Israel for this time, and, and they've been sent into captivity as a part of God's judgment on the generations of disobedience in the lives of the Jews. And so now the Jews are returning to the land, but guess what? They get back to their home country, and they recognize that everything has changed. It's kind of like when people were coming that left the island before Hurricane Ivan were returning, and when they came back and they saw all the destruction and everything and just how everything had completely changed People were in shock. They were disappointed. They were confused. As a matter of fact, even us who were here for the hurricane, when we walked outside our houses, some of us couldn't even recognize where we were because everything had just changed so much. Well, this is basically what the people of Israel are experiencing right now in the book of Ezra. They're returning to the land. Everything's changed. And here's the thing that disturbed them. As they look at Jerusalem, their holy city, the capital of, of their nation, and when they look at it, all they can see is ruins and rubble, and their enemies are still in control of parts of their land and, and all kinds of things that, that, that would just make anybody feel bad, make anybody feel depressed or disappointed. 
They look and their buildings have been looted. Their temple has been destroyed. And, and as a matter of fact, this was sort of the worst thing that could have happened for many of them because about 500 years earlier, Solomon built the temple and it was the most glorious temple that had ever been built in all Israel. And so the people that knew what this temple looked like come back and they go, oh my goodness, basically our temple has been destroyed. What are we supposed to do now? This was the most glorious temple that has been ever built for God. It's the most beautiful and wonderful house of God you will ever see in your entire life. And they have destroyed it. They looted it. It's nothing but a pile of rubble and destruction now. The Babylonians took everything that was worth anything from their, these Jews, including their lives. And Ezra tells us, that the Jews did three things when they came back from Babylon. But those three things that they did were extremely important things. The three things that they did were, were things that, that needed to happen in that nation even long before this took place. But you know, here's one of the things that I've discovered in life is that sometimes we've got to go through some things in order to realize some things. You know that? Because sometimes there are things that could be right in front of our face and we just completely refuse to do anything about it or we even sometimes can't even see it even though it's right in front of us. And sometimes what it takes is for us to go through something in order for us to be aware, in order for us to know, in order for us to understand and experience how can this be different. How can this be done? And basically, that's what happened. And so as a result of the Jews going through what they went through, they began to realize some things, and they did three things as soon as they got back to Jerusalem. And I'll just tell them to you really quickly. The first thing that they did was they rebuilt the altar. And if you have your, your Bible open, that basically consists of Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 down to verse 6. They rebuilt the altar. The second thing that they did was they rebuilt the foundation of the temple, which is essentially around verse 7 to verse 9. And then after that, they basically have a praise celebration. They just, you know, they, they just start praising the Lord. And that's from around verse 10 and 11. And so we see these things taking place, and we're going to go through it and, and, and talk about it this morning. But that's what we see happening here in Ezra chapter 3. But something strange begins to happen as they begin to praise God. And I want us to read that, and we're going to read verses 12 down to verse 13 this morning in Ezra 3. And it says, But many of the priests and Levites, heads of the fathers' houses, old men had, who had seen the first temple, who had seen Solomon's temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the, no the noise of the weeping of the people. Now check that out. Basically, what happens here is all of a sudden they begin to have this big praise celebration. But in the midst of that praise celebration, you've got people who are crying and weeping as they look at what they remember the place to be. And it's no longer that thing. As I said, you know, some of these people have, have been away from, from Israel from, oh, for over 50 years. And so most of these people are probably in their 60s or so. So they remember what it used to be like. They remember the beauty of this place. And so you can imagine their disappointment when they get home only to realize that the beauty and the splendor of the place that they used to live is now destroyed. But yet after these three things had taken place, or, or particularly the first two things, the rebuilding of the altar and the rebuilding or relaying of the foundation, the young people who had never even, most of these people probably had been born in Babylon. And they'd never known what it looked like. But after the altar was rebuilt and after the foundation was relayed, they began to shout for joy. They began to praise. And you know what? I see the same thing happening all over the world in our communities all over the world. We've got people at the same time. We've got people over here shouting and rejoicing. And we've got people in the midst of those same people weeping and crying from disappointment. And God does something absolutely amazing in their life. But what a strange scene that would be. Can you imagine that taking place? You know, we, and we even see that happen sometimes during worship. 
You know, we've got other people that, that, you know, they're just, they're praising the Lord and they're shouting to God and they're, you know, big smile on their face. And you've got other people that are on their knees just bowing before the Lord, just in tears, weeping, crying to God, crying out to God. And it can sometimes be a little bit of a strange scene because how can people simultaneously be both filled with joy and filled with disappointment and despair? The temple was destroyed. And 50 years later, again, the Jews returned from captivity, recaptivity to rebuild it. And so two generations being born in Babylon now come back, and, and, and these people were, were disappointed at what they found. And you may be facing a disappointing situation this morning, but I want you to remember that God is with you. And that there may be people around you who are, are filled with joy. There may be people around you who are shouting and, and, and laughing and carrying on, but just because you're in a disappointing place in your life right now doesn't mean that God's forgotten you. You see, we've, we've all been in those places before. Those places of disappointment. You know, everyone, everyone alive will know disappointment sooner or later. I'm not speaking something negative over your life. I'm not trying to come down on you this morning and, and, and tell you, oh, you know, it's all bad and dreary. That's not what I'm saying. But the realistic truth is that at some point in life, someone, somewhere, something is going to disappoint us. It may not be something big. It may only be something small. But we will be disappointed at some point in time in our lives. And we live in a world of disappointment, and if we're not careful, what's going to happen is we're going to be even unhappier and even more disappointed tomorrow than we were today if we don't pay attention and come to grips with the fact that there will be people and things in life that will disappoint us. I'm not telling you don't get your hopes up. I'm not telling you to, be, to just be, you know, all negative Nancy over there, you know, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we must realize that those things will happen in life. But it doesn't have to stay that way. It does not have to stay that way. You know, our friends, they'll break their word. Our marriages will sometimes end. We'll sometimes get into arguments with our spouses or or our children. Or, you know, our children will disappoint us and do things that that we taught them better than they were supposed, that they shouldn't have done that. It happens. It happens in our own families. As a matter of fact, there are times where we even become disappointed with ourselves. Ever been there? I can't believe I let this happen. I can't believe I did. I'm so disappointed in myself. Why would I do that? Why would I let that happen? You know what? We we get there sometimes. There's a gentleman, he's an English author by the name of, of Joseph Addison, sorry. And he said this, he says, Our real blessings often appear to us in the shapes of pains and losses and disappointments. And here's what he's saying is that sometimes, as I said earlier, we've got to go through some things in order to gain some things. What's that old saying? No pain, no gain. Sometimes we're going to have to face some things in life in order for us to receive the blessings that are there. And it's not because God's looking at us and going, oh, yeah, you know, I just need to punish you so you can be blessed. That's not what he's saying. But what happens sometimes is that we need to experience some things because I don't know about you, but I'm a stubborn person. And God might speak to me and tell me something and I don't listen to God. You know, I want you to realize something. Alexander the Great basically conquered, you know, most of the known world at the time. Wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Man was basically the ruler of the world at that time, and he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Many of us are familiar with Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, well, he wasn't always the president, and at one point in time, he ran against Stephen Stephen Douglas for U.S. Senator, and he lost. And when they asked him how he felt about it, he says, I feel like the boy who stubbed his toe. I'm too big to cry and too badly hurt to laugh. Now, he lost the U.S. Senate race, but guess what? He went on to become the president of the country. 
You see, sometimes we're going to have to experience some pains and some losses in our lives in order to experience the rebirth of the blessing that God has for us further down the road. So we've got to be aware of that. Dr. Jerome Frank at at Johns Hopkins University, he talks about our assumptive world, the assumptions that we make in life. He says, you know, basically that that we all make certain assumptions about life and and oftentimes our assumptions about things are unstated. So deep down we believe that if we do certain things, certain people will treat us a certain way. We assume that we've earned the right to have certain things in life and so if those expectations are not met, then we're disappointed with life. And he said there's a strong correlation between good mental health and having assumptions that match reality. And there's a high correlation between misplaced assumptions and a variety of emotional problems, including depression. So basically, if you think properly about your assumptions in life, guess what? It leads to having better mental faculties in life, thinking better about things, and recognizing that there will be times where you'll be disappointed. But at other times, if you know, we just constantly assume that we will never be disappointed and, and, you know, we go, oh, everybody in life just disappoints me. You know, I put my hope and my faith and my trust in people and everybody just keeps disappointing me. That it leads us to dark places in life. It can lead us to the place of even depression or even not trusting people. So he says, basically, put simply, that we are disappointed when things don't go the way that we thought that they were going to go. Wrong expectations leads to disappointment, and disappointment leads to despair. And that happens. And this is what we see taking place here, partly with the Jews in Ezra chapter 3. People are disappointed because of what they saw. And, and, and basically, The reason they were disappointed was because they remembered how good things used to be. How beautiful the temple was. How wonderful this temple was. They remember how good it was. And they lived in the past with all its glory. And they had trouble dealing with the present reality of what the situation was. And sometimes we're going to experience that. And if we're ever going to overcome disappointment in our lives, then we've got to recognize that there are three things that are necessary that the Jews did here in Ezra chapter 3, which we basically talked about already. Three things that we need to do in order to overcome disappointment. We need to follow the example that the Jews left for us in Ezra 3. And so the first thing we saw them do was rebuild the altar. Rebuild the altar. That's what we need to do. You know, the returning exiles, they first and foremost began by building the altar. You know, they didn't build the temple first and then put the altar in. They built the altar before they built the temple. They went there and they said, you know what, we, we've got to do something here. And so they went and they, they built the altar and they immediately began to make sacrifices. If you read the chapter, you see that in there. And verse 1 notes that that they came together as one people in the unity to work together to accomplish this goal. And so the entire nation that was there at that time recognized the importance of this. In Ezra chapter 3 verse 3 it says, Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, talking about their enemies, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Both of the morning and the evening burnt offerings. Now, I want you to recognize something is that the altar was central to worship during Old Testament times. And it's significant that they rebuilt the altar first because of the fact that it was significant to worship. And they rebuilt the altar before even rebuilding the temple. And the reason they did that was because they recognized that worship must always come first. They recognize that worship must always come first. And out of the rubble of their disobedience in life, they needed to reestablish and make sure that they were right with God in their relationship with him. 
And so the first thing that they go back and they do is they rebuild that altar and they say, hey, we've got to make this thing right with God because we've been disobedient. That's why we got sent into Babylon in the first place. They said, so before we do anything, before we even build anything, before we repair our homes, before we do any of this other stuff, the first thing we've got to do is get right with God. Worship comes first. Again, the altar was that symbolic center in the Old Testament of worship. And without the altar, there could be no proper worship. Without the altar, there was no access to God. Without the altar, they could not get close to God. They, they couldn't even ask for forgiveness of sin because there was no way to make sacrifices. There was no lambs or, or anything that they could slay for, 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 to ask God to do anything for them because of the fact of their disobedience and that they had no altar. The altar was the link between God and man. It was a place where they could go. And during all the years in Babylon, the Jews had been cut off from this kind of worship. The Jews had been cut off from their access to God because of their disobedience. And here's what I'm saying to you this morning is that sometimes what we need to do is get a new and a fresh beginning with God. Sometimes the things in our lives that were once there, sometimes the altars that we built of worship in our lives to God get destroyed or become rubble and downtrodden. And what we need to do is come in and rebuild those altars in our lives and reestablish access with God. See, I'm not telling you you've got to build some shrine in your home to God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about in your heart. And talking about coming to the Lord and just recognizing that there's some things in your life that sometimes you've got to just say to God, God, I recognize this hasn't been right with you. God, I recognize that I've been disobedient, that I haven't been listening to your voice, that I haven't been following the leading of your Holy Spirit. And I need to clean this stuff out and rebuild your altar in my heart that I may have right relationship with you. And I'm not just talking to the unbeliever, I'm talking to the believer as well. Because we've all got some junk in our lives, no matter whether we're a Christian or not. We need a fresh start sometimes. And sometimes the circumstances of life beat us down and beat us into a corner where we stop trusting God. Where we stop relying on him, where we stop going to him. And in that time, we need a return to the altar. And you know what that is for us in the New Testament? What that is for us today? What that is for us as Christians is running to the cross. Because you see, the altar was where they made sacrifices. And the reason we don't have to make sacrifices today is because Jesus made that sacrifice for us. And because he did that, all we've got to do is we've got to run to the cross and run to Jesus and just say, Lord, I recognize what you've done for me, and I repent of my sin. I repent of what's going on in my life, and I'm coming to you today because I realize that there's some things in my life that aren't right with you. And when we're not right with God, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to rebuild those broken altars in our lives and make our relationship right with God. And that's the first thing that they did. That's the first thing that they did. You know, can you imagine after Hurricane Ivan, with all the damage that was done to your home, can you imagine saying, you know, we've got to go and build Agape back up first before we, we head to our house and start fixing some of the issues and problems we've got at our home. Can you imagine doing that? The place where you eat and sleep and drink and, and, and you know, where you spend a lot of your time but you say, I'm not going to deal with that first. I'm going to come to the church and, and rebuild that first. And that's essentially what they did. But that wasn't all they did. As I said, they, they relayed the foundation of the temple. They relayed the, the foundation of the temple. And this is significant because they've already reestablished their relationship with God. They've reestablished the, the altar, and so they, they're reestablishing worship in the nation. And I don't want you to forget this. They did it, as, as Ezra chapter uh, 3 verse 1 tells us, that they did it in one voice, basically, as one nation, as one people. 
But in order for them to rebuild the foundation or relay the foundation of the temple, here's what they had to do. They had to clean up the area. Here's the thing is that, again, this, this temple has been destroyed. If you've ever been to Israel or if you've ever seen any pictures of, of, of the temple mount, you know that it's not a small space. It's a very big space. And they have to go and basically remove because their city has been besieged. The temple has been destroyed. They've got to remove all the rocks and all the boulders and all the pillars that have fallen over and all these kinds of things. They've got to go and they've got to clear all of that stuff out. Clear it all out before they can even do anything. And they began to rebuild in, in this field of rubble, and they started clearing and cleansing, cleansing everything that had fallen, everything that was destroyed out of the temple. Rocks. They hadn't been there in over 50 years. No, you know, nobody was keeping, keeping the grounds. You know, um, <laughs> you can just imagine the scene, you know, Trees growing up everywhere, weeds everywhere, you know, just, just vines and stuff all, all over the place, you know, just, just having to completely clear the place out. And then Ezra chapter 3 verse 7, it says, and I, want you to recognize, I want you to hear this good. It says, they also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, why is this significant? It's because they recognized, first of all, that they didn't have all the materials they needed in their own lives in order to rebuild the temple, in order to relay the foundation. And so what, is, what does the scripture tell us that they did? It, they went looking for the masons and the carpenters. They went looking for the people who had the skills to be able to do it. And then it says they went to, to Sidon and Tyre. Those are two cities. And they basically went to them and they said, hey, we need some help in order to rebuild our lives. We need some people who have the, the experience, the skills, the knowledge, the resources to help us put our lives back on track. What am I telling you this morning? We need people in our lives who are going to be there to encourage us and build us up and help us to reestablish things when we're dealing with disappointment in our lives. Because here's what happens when we don't get those people. Don't find, listen, if you're discouraged, I'm going to discourage you from doing something. Don't go and find more discouraged people. Bad idea. Because discouraged people who find discouraged people, guess what you all make? More discouraged people. And all you do is you, you go and you breed more discouragement amongst one another and, and you're going and, you know, man, I had a bad day today. Me too. Why are you going to tell me about how bad your day was? Man, my boss and this and that. And, and yeah, yeah, you know, my boss too. And, you know, man, I just can't take it. And, you know, my old husband, he, yeah, my, my wife, da, 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 da. And you know what? You walk away from that conversation. You don't feel no better. You know what you, you're likely to say? Well, at least it's not only me going through that. That's not encouraging. That's not where you want to be. I'm not saying that you can't talk to other people who may be experiencing discouragement. What I'm saying is, is don't just surround yourself with discouraging people. Because the only thing that they're going to help you do is be discouraged. What you need to do is use wisdom like what the Jews did. And you need to find some people, some godly people to put in your life that are going to help you rebuild the broken things in your life. You see, here's the thing is that nobody can reestablish the altar of worship in your life for you. Nobody can make you worship God. Nobody can make you have a relationship with God. Nobody can make you come to that altar of sacrifice, can come to the cross and say, Lord, I need you. Nobody can do that. You've got to do that for yourself. But what you can have people help you with is help you to rebuild the things that are broken. You see, you, nobody can come to Jesus for you. 
but people can help lead you in the way that God is leading you. People can encourage you on that road. People can come and, and, and point you and say, hey, no, no, that's not what the word says. What does the word say? You see, as Christians, as biblical people, this is what we stand on, the word of God. And when we start pointing people in other directions, when we start showing people, hey, you know, no, 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 why you don't try this or why you don't look at this, why don't we just come and say, hey, what does God's word say? What, what does God's word say? You know, what, that, that God is a, a refuge and a strong tower, that he's an ever-present help in time of need, that he loves us, that he's there for us, that, that, that he's our strength and our fortress, and all these things are comforter. What do we need? We need people that will point us back to Jesus, point us back to Christ, point us back to where we need to be. When we need somebody to pray with us, we can call them and say, man, I'm having a rough day today and I feel so discouraged. And you know what they say? Let me pray with you. Let me pray with you. How can I pray for you? How can I pray for your family during this time of difficulty? You know, I've discovered something is that a lot of times when people are discouraged, they're not looking for answers necessarily. They're just looking for somebody to care with them, care for them. It's not that they necessarily need you to, to and my wife tells me this all the time. She says, Andrew, sometimes I need you to just close your mouth and listen. You can laugh. <laughs> and she tells me that because there are times where she's not looking for me to fix the problem. She just needs me to listen and pray with her. I don't need to give her, you know, the three-step solution. I don't need to tell her, honey, if you just do this, it'll be all right. Even though it would be. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> But my point is this, I'm just teasing, but, but my point is this, is that we need people who are going to be there to encourage us. And if we don't have people in our lives to encourage us, then guess what? We're going to always be disappointed and discouraged. But I want you to recognize something about this as well. The people who encourage you are just as capable of discouraging and disappointing you. They are. Think about the people that hurt you the most. Who are they? They're the people that you love the most. Your family members. People like that. Those are the people that hurt you the most. See, I'm struck by two facts here in Ezra chapter 3. First, they committed to following the Lord in the details of their life and rebuilding the altar. See, verse 2 and verse 4 emphasizes something for us. And I'm not going to read them, but you can read them in your own time. But, but it, it shows us that when they rebuilt the altar, that it says that they did it according to the law is what it says. Meaning what? That they went back to the scriptures, they went back to the word of God, and they followed the details of what God told Moses to do. Now, I want you to realize, Moses, this was way back we're talking about the olden days, the good old days. That, that's how far back Moses was. Moses was history to them. None of them ever met him before. None of them knew who he was. They just heard about Moses. But they followed the details of what God laid out for them to do in his word. And the second thing that they did, they relayed the foundation in spite of all the enemies that surrounded them. Remember we read it and we said that they were afraid because of their enemies? Listen, there's going to be some things in your life that are going to, going to be fearful for you. Some things you're going to be afraid to deal with. Some things that, that, that you're going to, I, I don't know that I want to talk about this. I don't know that I want to deal with this. I don't know that I, we, we need, do we really need to? And God's telling us, hey, listen, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid that, that even though you may be facing some difficulties right now, you don't have to be afraid. And as a matter of fact, as the story unfolds, one of the things that we see happen is that their enemies try to discourage them and stop them. And guess what? They even temporarily succeed, but guess what? It doesn't last. And there's going to be seasons in our lives where we're going to go through disappointed, where things are going to happen, whether it's the devil or whether it's people or whether it's whoever is going to try and stop us from moving in the direction that God's leading us. But guess what? Even if they succeed temporarily, nothing can stop God's plan for your life. Nothing. 
See, when the enemy lines up against you, what are you going to do? Are you going to back off and back away and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to give up? I want to encourage you with this. Put your faith ahead of your fears this morning. Put your faith in God ahead of your fears this morning. Put your faith in who he is and what he's done this morning instead of in your fears. Because the more you look at your fears, the more you're going to be afraid. But the more you look at God, the more encouraged, the more full of faith you will become. And even though there may be those things that you're still afraid of in your heart, you're still going to know I am in God's hands this morning. I don't remember who it was. I walked in church and I said, how are you doing this morning? Somebody said to me, I'm in his hands. Oh, Sister Jennifer, that's right. I just thought that was so awesome. I'm in his hands. Guess what? Because that's where we need to be. In his hands. Don't worry about what the problem is. Don't worry about the situation. Just say, I'm in your hands, God. See, I want you to recognize something is that it didn't happen overnight that the altar and the temple was rebuilt or even that the foundation was relayed. Didn't happen overnight. It took a long time before this happened. And guess what? Little by little, day by day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they did what they could do. Little by little. And I think where we get tripped up sometimes is we begin to look at all the things in our lives. We begin to look at the mess that has been built up over the last 50 years of neglect. And we think we've got to conquer it all in one go. We think that we've got to deal with it all right now. In this moment, we've, just, we've got to take it all on. When, if we would just deal with it little by little. If we would take a step a day, guess what? You know, you'll eventually get there if you take one step every day. It might take a long time. But if you take one step every day, you'll eventually get to where you're going. And what I'm saying to you is this morning is that, is that even though we can be disappointed and, and sometimes we don't know what to do, the best thing that we can do is put our trust in God and take little steps every day. Every day. Clean up those areas in our lives that have been neglected is what we need to do. Or let me say it this way. We just need to do what we know is right. We just need to do what we know God is calling us to do. Trust in God. Don't let your disappointment, don't let your discouragement keep you from know, doing what you know God's called you to do. John Maxwell, he said this. He said, the smallest act of obedience is better than the greatest intention. I want you to hear that again. The smallest act of obedience is greater or better than the greatest intention. Here's why. It's because an intention is only an intention and it will always remain an intention if you never do anything about it. It will always remain in your head and your heart. But guess what? That doesn't, that doesn't do anybody any good. That doesn't, that doesn't help you. That doesn't help anybody. You know, you know somebody said to me just recently, you know, um, we, we were having a conversation, and I said, I had intended to, buy a house, uh, to build a house. And said, we bought. And I said, well, what, what preparations did you make to build a house? I said, none. And they just looked at me and they said, oh, okay. And they kind of chuckled to themselves. Here's why. is because it was only an intention. I bought a house. I didn't, I, I didn't build it. And even though in the end I still ended up with a house, guess what? The point is, is that I didn't do what I intended to do. I did something else. So the greatest intention in the world will do you no good, but a small step in the right direction will do a whole lot more. We just need to keep walking towards God. It's better to do a little bit at a time and just sit around dreaming about doing a lot. Do what you know needs to be done. And, and no matter how small it is, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. No matter, no matter what, how disappointing it may be, don't just sit around daydreaming about, oh, what life could be. Get up and do something about it. Get up and take one step. Uh, again, if it's only one step, don't lay in bed all day complaining about it. I get up and say, what can I do today to make one step forward to a better tomorrow? 
What can I do today to walk one step closer to God and one step out of my disappointment? So they rebuilt the altar, reestablished their connection with God. They relayed the foundation. They cleaned out all the stuff, all the junk that was in their lives, all the rubble, everything. They got rid of it, and they found people to encourage and establish them and help them on the right path. The third thing they did was they resolved to praise the Lord. They resolved to praise the Lord. Verse 10 and 11 says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God. And then this is what they sang, for he is good for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Now, this is what we see happening. They've done all these things, and to be honest with you, it's really not very much. And all of a sudden, they're having this big praise party. When we think about in comparison to what needs to be done in the nation, the entire nation needs to be rebuilt. Imagine all of Cayman is destroyed, and it needs to be rebuilt. And the only thing that we rebuild is one place to go and worship. Most of us would look at the the destruction around and go, well, we didn't do very much, did we? But at least, you know, the church is done. And that's essentially what they did. Here's what I'm saying. They didn't stop and look at everything else that had gone wrong. They stopped and they thanked God for what had gone right. Sometimes our focus goes in the wrong direction and we start looking at things we don't need to look at. And they didn't wait until their building was done. They didn't wait until the temple was done and established before they started to praise God. No, no, they didn't, they didn't do that. Even though the laying of the foundation was significant, there was years of work to still be done before they were finished. But yet in the midst of all of that, they stopped. And this was only the first step. And they stopped and they began to praise God. What a lesson that is for us. What an encouragement that is for us. And I want you to recognize something that our praising of God in the midst of our difficult circumstances is a choice, not a feeling. Because we can sometimes confuse the fact that, oh, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. It's a choice to praise God in the midst of difficult circumstances. I didn't say it was easy, but it's still a choice. And we should praise God in the midst of our circumstances because nothing was really going perfect for these people. Nothing was, you know, it it wasn't the perfect set of circumstances. It was not the perfect situation. And yet, even in spite of all those things, they decided, you know what? We need to praise God for what he has done. We've reestablished our relationship with him. We've reestablished our connection. And now we need to move forward and begin to praise him. And that's exactly what they begin to do. And I want to encourage you to do something. Don't wait until the victory has been won in your life in order to praise God. Start praising him before the victory is won. Start thanking him for things even before you get them. Start praising him and giving him the victory. Say, Lord, I know that you have said I'm the head and not the tail, that I'm above and not beneath. And I'm going to praise you for this, God. Because, like I said, they faced some disappointment after this. Because their enemies came along and stopped them, but that didn't stop them from doing what they knew they needed to do. You see, we, we, we just got, we simply got to look and just say, God, I'm going to trust in you. You are giving me the victory. And it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. And by doing that, by, by putting our faith in God, by, by praising him in the midst of the battle, even praising him before the battle, it puts our soul in the right place in order for us to go through our circumstances with joy. That even though the situation may not be good, we don't have to be disappointed 
We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to be downtrodden the whole time. We can still have the joy of the Lord. And guess what? What does the scripture say about the joy of the Lord? That it will be our strength. It will be our strength. See, you don't have to go through it with disappointment. You don't have to go through it being discouraged. And I'm, and I'm not saying that, 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 that those things will not come. I'm saying you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay in the midst of those things. You can come out of them. And it's a great advance in our spiritual walk with God if we can praise him even when things are not going the way that we plan for them to go, want them to go, think they should go. But we continue to get closer to God. And it's just absolutely amazing how he works in our lives. And we can do exactly what the Jews did here. But you notice what they, what they began singing. This was the song that they sang. They said, God is good. He is good. And his mercy endures forever. They started out saying that God is good. Guess what? We can start saying that too. We can start in the midst of our battle saying God is good. That's what true faith is. Anyone can praise God when the sun is shining. Anybody can praise God when everything's going good in their life. Anybody can praise God when, you know, somebody said to me, they said, you know, I just, I got a new car and I want to praise God for this new car. I said, that's fantastic, but are you going to praise him when you don't have gas to put in it? Are you going to praise him when everything's going wrong in your life? Are you going to praise him when everything doesn't seem to be going good? Because we're going to face those circumstances in life. And it's not about just praising God in the good times, but can we praise him in the bad times? Because you see, that's what helps bring us through them. And see, you know, a lot of this, this scripture talks about the older generation and the younger generation. And I don't want you to read this and, and go, oh, older generations versus the younger. But I want you to see something. The older generation or the younger generation needed the older generation to teach them the lessons on how to live. Because they were there, they've experienced it, they know about it, they know about life. So, so the older generation, you know, they, they were of great benefit to this younger generation. Even though right now they were weeping and, and groaning because of what they saw, but, but they could have been a great benefit to this younger generation. But I want you to see something else. Is that the older generation needed the younger generation to help them see that all hope wasn't lost and that there was a new hope in front of them today. And what I'm saying to you is sometimes you've got to stop looking back and start looking forward. You've got to stop looking at the old things and start looking at the new things that God's doing in your life. You've got to let go of some of those things that God's been telling you for a while need to be cleaned out. Sweep them out. Take the garbage out and begin to look towards the things that God is doing in your life now. Because it's easy to look back and go, oh, but remember when that happened. And that's not just the old people that does that, you know. That's every single person alive. Every single one of us. You know, because when you get to high school, you miss middle school. And when you get to college, you miss high school. Then when you get to your workplace, you miss college. So it ain't just all the people that feel that way. Every single one of us, we go through seasons of life looking backwards. And God's saying it's time to stop looking back. And it's time to start looking forward. And this is what the people did in Ezra's day. They rolled up their sleeves. They got to work. And as they worked, with the fulfillment of their dreams still far off, they offered praise to God. And that's what we need to do today, is offer our praise to God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you this morning for this word. And Lord, I pray that every person in this room today is encouraged. I pray today right now, Father God, that, that even though we may be in the midst of disappointment, that Father God, we don't have to stay there. That, Lord, that we can come out of that disappointment. That, Father God, that even in the midst of those difficult circumstances, that we can begin to praise you and worship you and that your joy will be our strength. God, I thank you today for every person in this room. 
And I thank you, Lord, that you have placed a purpose, a call, a plan over their lives. And that, Lord, that right now, even though it may be difficult for them to look out and see, that even though what's in front of them may be a little bit foggy, that, God, you know the way. You know the way. You know the direction that we need to be going. And, and, and Lord, we just need to simply trust in you and follow you. And I pray that this morning that would be where our hearts are. To follow you and serve you every day of our lives. Every day of our lives. Hallelujah. This morning, the Lord actually gave me some declarations that, that I feel that we need to declare this morning before we go. And I, and I want to I wanna take this opportunity to just open the altar. Because here's the thing that I know is that, that we all face discouragement. We all face disappointing things in life. And some of us, those things have never been dealt with. Some of those things are in the past, or maybe some of those things happened this week. But whatever, however it happened, whenever it happened, I know that today is a day where we don't have to stay in our discouragement, in our disappointment. I don't want to open the altar. If you want to, if you want to come down to the altar this morning, as a matter of fact, I invite you to come down to the altar this morning. For whatever it is you may be facing, whatever it is you may be, be dealing with here today, even myself, even myself. But I want you to stand with me this morning. There's two things that the Lord wants sort of a, I feel the Lord wants us to sort of just declare as a reminder to ourselves as, as a result of this message this morning. And the first one is, is this, is that, it, and I'm going to read it, and then after that we'll, we'll repeat it together, but it's better to begin small with God than not to begin at all. That's the first thing, because you see, we need to remember First of all, that it doesn't matter where we go, what we do, however we do it, it's better to begin small with God. Doing those small things than not to do it at all. And this morning, on the count of three, I just want us to read that together. One, two, three. It's better to begin with small with God than not to begin at all. I want you to remember that this morning. Doesn't matter how small the beginnings seem for you this morning, start small with God. Because even though we may come from small beginnings, and, and even Jesus, look at what God did. In order to save the world, God sent us a baby. One of the smallest, the, the smallest form of a human being. And yet, look at the great impact that Jesus has had. Don't despise small beginnings. But, but the next one is this. It's better to rejoice over what you have and to weep over what you used to have. And I want us to repeat that together on the count of three. One, two, three. It's better to rejoice over what you have than to weep over what you used to have. Listen, God's put things in your life today. I don't even need to know you to tell you that God has given you something this morning to rejoice about. He's given you something in your life. Even if it's only salvation, even if it's only a relationship with him, there's something this morning that can give you joy. And the thing that can give you joy this morning is Jesus. Even if nothing else, he can give you joy. He can give you joy. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching our television program, and we pray that you've been blessed by today's message. I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, and I'd like to take this opportunity to pray with you today and ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, I want you to pray with me this prayer and accept Him into your heart today, and you too can be a child of God. Let's pray this prayer. 
God, I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for all the wrong that I've done. And I ask you to come into my life today. Cleanse me and make me whole. I'm sorry and I ask you to lead me down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. I want to be your child and I want to do your will. Have your way in me today, Lord. And I will forevermore live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's all you had to do, folks. It's as simple as that. And so if you pray that prayer today, you're a child of God. And so I want to get you plugged into a church. Get plugged into a body, a fellowship of Christ somewhere. And get deeper into your relationship with God. Because there's no greater relationship than a relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful day with Jesus.